This is uh, the magazine in question, uh, the latest issue of Marg, as Sangeeta said, in the 73 years of Marg's history. This is the first time it's coming out with a special issue, like completely dedicated to the botanical arts. Um, uh, those who really do not know about Mar, uh, I'll, I'll just say a few words. Marg was founded in 1946 by a group of uh, very visionary writers, thinkers, um, architects. It was uh, inspired by the Mars group in uh, London, which, was, which really put together the London plan in 1933. So Marg is actually the modern architectural research group, which uh, they founded in 1946. It was also the thresh you're on the threshold of independence. So there was a need to understand this country which, you, which was just going to be independent. Like there was like huge uh, variety of, you have a sense that there is this uh, range of cultures, languages, you know, traditions which are there. But at the same time, the map was put together by the British. You haven't had a chance to really look at this as a unit for governance. So how would you go about this? How would you connect all these people? So this set of visionary thinkers, uh, they thought there is a critical need for a platform which would show a path. So Marg is also that pathway, in Misaged as a pathway. So this was, uh, this magazine was formed to document, critically look at bring together traditions from across this country to see how this, these cultural spaces can give us an opportunity to look at governance organically. So uh, it has been in continuous publication for the last 72 years and uh, so this is the latest edition. We also have books uh, but uh, this magazine, this issue is very special because as we said, this is the first time we are trying to look at the botanical arts. This field, which is normally considered a very specialized area, but uh, please get a copy, the uh, copies are at the book, book shop. Uh, you will go through this volume, which is put together by Sita Reddy, she's a guest editor, um, and uh, Henry and Lena are contributors to this magazine. Uh, Henry is uh, a researcher, he was curator at Royal Botanical Gardens, Edinburgh. Uh, Lena is a curator and, uh, uh, you know, they have all been in this field. But what is very, uh, uh, really relevant about this volume, you will see through the presentation, there are so many facets of this field which were completely unknown or the public did not know about it. So this Sita has done an admirable job of bringing out various uh, facets of this thing. So suddenly you realize that it is not a specialized area. Henry's article, for instance, is talking about how during the company column, the commission, you know, all these archives are known after the commissioners. But suddenly he is trying to bring out the different Chitrakars who actually did the thing. So he is reinserting those names. So it's very, very relevant, like we, we were also talking about the, 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 the Dalit issue and Anand's arrest and all that. So until today, it's so very relevant how we marginalize, you know, put, take certain sections of the society out of the main frame of discourse and how certain names are not there at all. So one would, this is an unexpected space from where such a critical insight is coming. You wouldn't imagine that like a very specialized research oriented kind of uh, area would bring forth this kind of very contemporarily relevant uh, idea. So Henry will talk about it and um, so there are various aspects of this uh, uh, thing. You look at art education itself, like there are uh, 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 references to how art education itself can be re-looked at from the prism of the botanical arts because you're, if you look, look at school education, people are going so away from, like it's just skill, 
either or it is a kind of theoretical exercise which has nothing to do with like how you actually live and connect with nature. So that kind of an insight come into art education. So all these things uh, put together, Lena's work on archives, like particular archive, she is, she is talking about a particular archive, it's important she, she will talk about. So uh, you, this is a this is a uh, treasure house of uh, you know knowledge. Not only about like you know as it's not a predictable knowledge house. It's a very unpredictable, unexpected kind of knowledge house. Please get your copies. Now I leave uh, the uh, uh, voice to <laughs> Sita, who will take you through this magazine, and then we can uh, listen to Henry and Lena. Over to you. Sorry. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for giving us your Saturday afternoon on a rainy Republic Day. Um, I'm just delighted to be here and in this company. Um, thanks to HLF, thanks to uh, Goethe Centrum, if Amita is here, uh, the Marg editorial team, and especially Latika Gupta, who was a real collaborator and an interlocutor. And a special shout out to India Foundation for the Arts, who, was, who just presented their stage talk, because you know this is a chance to use the many botanical metaphors that we will use today. They gave me a seed grant a few years ago to just kind of do a little survey of, it was called Under the Arts Research Documentation Project. And um, sort of, you know, it's a special shout out to them because really the result was, um, thank you Tanvi Rajsi. So I'd like to start with the title. a literary festival, so it's a good place to pay homage to a poet. Um, the quote, that the fragment of the quote that we have on the cover comes from this slightly longer quote by Lauren Isley, who was a, uh, he was, uh, W.H. Auden was a big fan, Ray Bradbury was a big fan, and you know, he's been called um, he, one of the finest poets, uh, com contemplative poets of natural history. And um, the, it's drawn from an essay called How Flowers Change the World. And uh, he's not talking about flower power or hate Ashbury here. He's talking about a distant time when, um, in the Mesozoic era, when there was a soundless, these are his words, when there's a soundless and violent explosion. Uh, of course, it was an explosion that lasted millions of years uh, when you saw the rise of flowering plants, angiosperms, encased seeds. And um, he goes on, the Mark team, I have to say, pushed for the title. I was going to go with something more boring like Ars Botanica or something. And I'm so glad that they did because how one sees plants, how one visualizes them, um, carries tremendous weight. And, um, you know, this is the longer quote. And at one stroke, it signals not only to the historical weight of that evolutionary moment when flowers changed the world and us, because it enabled our presence on the planet, uh, but also the moral weight and the burden and obligation on all of us for the future. Um, when we are changing and destroying flowers, um, the rich biodiversity of flora, it's an environmental cautionary tale kind of packed into a poem, and it's all resting on that fragile petal. Um, so if it goes, we go. You know, and so it was sort of a nice way to kind of like have it resting on that. Uh, I'm sorry, it's actually, it, it's, it's transitioning, right? Yeah. Okay. So, you know, that's a good way to kind of move into so much for words. Now we have to moving into images. Um, the emphasis on flowers is particularly relevant in the Indian context because they're kind of two ways two ways up until the 18th century that plants were, I'm simplifying drastically, but plants were depicted visually in two somewhat distinct ways. The famous flower studies uh, in, uh, uh, so this, is, this comes from, this is done by the master 
painter Mansoor from the Mughal Emperor Jahangir's court. And on the left, you have a fragment from the a page from the Gulshan album. Uh, which is now in Tehran, and on the right you have tulips, both unfamiliar flowers for their time, and these were 1602, 1603. So that's kind of one way in which it was kind of uh, depicted as an aesthetic form. And then, in the 17th century, uh, I just wanted to pull these up here. All of these images are in the volume, so I'm kind of only drawing from that archive. This is sort of a larger of, um, illustrated herbals where you had to draw plants to identify them med medicinally. Um, and uh, all of, the, I wanted to, when, I, when Mark approached me to do the volume, I wanted to fold these two, include these two streams, um, and how they kind of fed into what we now know as botanical art, which is a document of, in the 18th and 19th century, it was a form of documentation of the natural world. Um, and um, I also wanted to challenge how an earlier generation of art historians uh, had uh, defined this body of work as a subgenre of, I, Sangeeta mentioned it, of company school painting or company kalam, and in which Indian artists, um, Rizio mentioned it, were commissioned by European East India Company officials, botanists, surgeons, um, and it was a term populated, by, I mean, uh, popularized by Mildred Archer. Um, and um, in her, in that early definition, it indicated a blend of traditional um, elements from Mughal and Rajput miniature paintings with the more European ideas of perspective and volume and recession. Um, but, but by the mid-century, uh, mid-18th century, which was sort of like it coincided with what was the beginning of the golden age of botanical art, 1750 to 1850, uh, company botanicals were taken to include a, a co some combination of the following, rich watercolor, heightened by gum Arabic. <clears throat> I've included two examples, one from the, from no the North India and one from the South, that's from the Tanjore uh, Library, Saraswati Mahal. Uh, but they would have a few elements. One is the rich watercolor with gum Arabic, a highly developed sense of pattern, but maybe not perspective. Maybe I should keep my hand on this. Yeah. Um, uh, pattern and not perspective. Usually a composition which was on the diagonal and you had, where you had the, the, the plant almost spilling over the edge of the page. Almost, you know, difficult to contain within the frame of the page. Um, now, company column is a very useful label in some ways, but there are huge problems at its core. So, um, there are many things that it leaves out and actually erases and hides, most notably the name. Uh, Henry will talk a little bit more about this in his uh, talk, but here is an art form known by the, com the company corporate commissioner. And the Indian, the, almost always the anonymous Indian artist is hidden or erased from the entire archive. Um, so I knew I had to kind of like in some way uh, include, not include, but kind of like they, uh, you, you, um, invite scholars like Henry who have spent their lifetimes trying to reinsert these names into the volume. That was one large critique. Then there are others like William Dalrymple and Yutika Sharma have tried to kind of um, show that company painting was not that distinct from Mughal painting. Uh, so it's not a distinct genre because the same artists were working for the same patrons and they moved back and forth between different ways of visualizing them. And then the other big problem is sort of of chronology. If you're only focusing on British East India Company, what about, let's say, the Dutch, or the, uh, the Danish, or the French companies on that colonial encounter? And the region, there was a North Indian bias to uh, those of the, the paintings that had been studied from Calcutta. So what I wanted to do was sort of correct for all of those in the volume uh, and um, sort of open up the um, the richness of our, the archives, both in India and the UK, to others who are not looking, being uh, able to access it. Like, you know, the botanists were looking at these paintings, extraordinary paintings, but the art historians weren't, the ethnologists weren't, the linguists weren't. And so this was just this huge body of work that other than thinking about how to decolonize it and include the names of the Indian authors, need, needs a lot more research to actually, you know, 
to put the various uh, parts of the thing uh, together. Um, when Mark took shape, I knew that I wanted to address some of these gaps. So address the critique of company school head on and get scholars like Henry Nolte who, and uh, Savitri Preeta Nair. Uh, Eba Koch is, uh, has a different angle to uh, the company, the colonial encounter. But uh, to Henry and the two other lead essays, thank you enormously for writing at such short notice, six months. And you will see when you read this volume, they are gems, little gems, big gems, actually. Um, then I wanted to feature the sheer range and volume of archives that are in the Indi India and the UK. And in, in India, they're in a very precarious state because of the humidity in Calcutta Botanical Archives, of the insects, uh, the lack of resources. Um, so this was one way to kind of say, here is this incredible body of work. Just go in and, you know, Get, let's get some work going on this. So this was more of an invitation and a beginning rather than some way of closing uh, a sense of what we found in, through the research here. And then the finally, what I kind of wanted to link this dying tradition, I wouldn't call it dead, um, dying tradition with the present, on the one hand with contemporary artists who in some way deal with the idea of the botanical, in idea or practice. Um, and there are many and who are inspired by much of, much of these, the historical work that you have here. And on the other hand, the only two contemporary botanical art schools that there are in the South Asia subcontinent. So we actually feature them in the flyleaf, the thematic portfolio section right in front of the volume. And we wanted this to kind of like speak to the future and ways in which exclusion was thought about, but also how Thank you, Rizio. And also, and also how, you know, how do we go forward and how do we think about botanical art pedagogy? Um, so there are three large sections in the thing. I'm just going to run you through all of them. Uh, I've divided them into three large sections. One, the first one is histories. So that's an overview that I do. Uh, Eba Koch writes about um, the, uh, how Moga, Shah Jahan era monuments architectural monuments borrowed from European floral, floralegia, sorry. Yeah. Henry Nolte, who, whose essay is just amazing here, but I leave him to kind of like spell it out. It's just, it's packed. If I start talking about it, I won't stop. So Henry, just uh, forgive me if I overlook this now and leave it for you to fill in. Um, Savitri Pita Nair, who writes about the plants at the Tanjore court. Then we have three short, uh, notes on manuscripts, 17th century manuscripts. This is from something called the ja unpublished manuscript called the Jardin de Lorixa, which is the Garden of Orissa, uh, a 17th century manuscript from in France, in the Natural History Museum in France. Kapil Raj does a piece on that. Uh, the Gurney Herbal, an early, newly discovered British uh, herbal from, uh, a company herbal from the British Library that Preeta Nair writes about. I write about a Dutch uh, botanical called Hortus Indicus Malabaricus and try and trace the art behind it. And then a large section, about 10 short articles on archival spotlights, what we call archival spotlights. Five of them connected with um, botanic gardens, you know, like so archives which are connected to botanic gardens. This is in Calcutta, uh, Roxburgh Icones, which is a very famous body of work. Botanical Gallery in the Indian Museum, Lalbagh Botanical Drawings from Bangalore. Suresh Jairam does a lovely piece where he talks about the work of Cheluvaya Raju. Uh, and two uh, pieces from the Kew Gardens, Michelle Payne, who writes about a little, uh, an installation that is still up. If you go to Kew Gardens, you will see it in the Shirley Sherwood Botanical Gallery um, on uh, Marianne North's Hindu plants. She calls them Hindu plants and they actually say that on the title. And then Joseph Dalton Hooker and his Indian Botanical Art at Kew Gardens, which is a voluminous archive, and there's been much work that's been done on that. Then there are five um, archival notes on uh, archives that are not connected with Botanic Gardens. Uh, Henry and Mark do a piece on from the Linnaean Society of London, tracing the Buchanan Hamilton collection of drawings. Lena Vincent who is, uh, looks at the bladder herbarium's prints, but also we were trying to figure out how to do it uh, through the lens of 
prints of palms, um, of, uh, plants of the coast of Coromandel, another 18th century uh, volume that is at the Welcome Center, uh, Harvard, Harvard's Blaschka glass flower. So it's not just 2D, it's not just paintings. You have 3D enormous ways in which to model botanical art by Rishika Marishi. And uh, uh, this is from the J.C. Bose Trust, Emilia Terracciano. Uh, tries to kind of like visualize, uh, show us a way in which to visualize uh, botanical physiology. You know, all of this is botanical morphology or structure. This is a way in which how do you actually chart how, visualize how plants move. And this is from the Bose archive. And it's an extraordinary little piece where she has quite spectacular visual material. And then I, we kind of move to the present, sort of all links with the present. Seven extraordinary contemporary artists Damodar Lal Gurjar and Mahavir Swami, who identify as traditional um, botanical, um, uh, who use trad traditional botanical methods, art methods. Um, Sunoj D, who is inspired by Hortus Malabaricus, which I showed you an image of early on. Uh, Rohini Devarshar, who is responding to Goethe's uh, metamorphosis of plants. So, you know, there are all kinds of inspirations that are picked up all over the place. Meena Subramaniam, who's inspired by Marianne North from Kew Gardens, and Vaswo and uh, Vaswo X Vaswo and RVJ, who kind of foreground the colonial encounter. You have, in his own words, Vaswo as the Gora in his topi, um, uh, who is kind of like, uh, and it's a homage to um, uh, Bundi and Kota traditions of ways in which to depict the, the foliage. And then three, three exhibitions which deal with botanical loss. Uh, this, was, this was at the Botanical uh, Bombay Natural History Society. This was at the NCBS, the National Center of Botanical Sciences, where she did a um, wide-ranging exhibition on uh, the texts of medicinal plants, art of medicinal plants. And this was at the Welcome Center where um, Barbara Rodriguez Munoz actually looked at the collecting strategy of uh, Welcome himself in, when he was actually trying to put together his pharmaceutical, uh, as his pharmaceutical giant, his corpus. And uh, finally we end with uh, specially commissioned artist pages by Simran Gill, a contemporary artist who kind of revisits her visit to Pulau Run, which is one of the Banda Islands, the Spice Islands, uh, which were famous for, the, for its nutmeg plantations, no longer, but this was early on. And what was interesting here is she kind of touches on the fact that in the Anglo-Dutch wars, the, the Isle of uh, the Banda Islands and especially Rune was traded for the island of Manhattan, um, uh, which was at that time kind of owned by the, uh, the English. And so in a way, the, there are no plantations to be found on Rune anymore, but Manhattan, of course, has sort of like risen to uh, other heights. And then last but not least, this is what the uh, volume begins with, but I've left it for the end. These are the botanical art schools, two schools, one in Kathmandu and one in Kalimpong, run by remarkable South Asian women, uh, Hemlata Pradhan, so the schools here, Hemlata Pradhan and Neera Joshi. And um, they've kind of like taken on, they're trained both in taxonomy and in contemporary art. And they there are astonishingly few examples of this kind, but their idea is how does one actually think about this as Hemlata thinks of herself as an eco-warrior and she says this is the way I'm actually going to train young kids who are, who, to kind of like break out of any caste genealogies that might have restricted some people from taking on these artist forms. But uh, I wanted to leave you with the last image which is by one, a student of Hemlata Pradhan's, Celestine Lepcha. She's aged nine and uh, Mark actually, Liz, Rizio, I don't know if you can hold up that double spread and she's sort of like, she, it's astonishing her work and we wanted to include both her notes and her um, sketches as the final double spread before the volume begins. So I'm going to turn it over to Henry. Um, it's a great privilege and honor for me to be here. Um, it, it was completely out of the blue. Every January and February, I try to get out of Edinburgh, away from the cold and dark. And I can't think of anywhere better to come to Hyderabad. And it um, 
coincided with the um, launch of this really beautiful magazine which CETA has put together at incredibly short notice. Um, the title of my um, article, um, CETA already referred um, to the kind of angle I was taking and it's deliberately intriguing, so intriguing and opaque that the Marg editors tried to get me to change it, but um, I wanted it to be intriguing. Um, it says something about the Indian artists, but also emphasizing that they did make a contribution to um, botanical science, which hasn't really been recognized. Um, although botanical paintings made for British patrons, um, a huge amount has been written about them um, because of the um, archival sources. The Brits left lots of written records. The artists didn't, so the, the picture has been very biased. Um, and my aim in some of my work has been to try and turn this around. Um, so that more emphasis is given to the Indian creators of these works. Um, but I also do want to emphasize that it was a joint project and surely one of the brighter um, spots in the whole colonial encounter. I also want to question the concept of this designation of company school art, which um, Sita has referred to, and we'll come back to that. Um, but it is necessary to start with something about the scientists who commissioned this sort of work and the Royal Botanic Garden collections that I'm lucky enough to work on, which have led me to look at these questions. And although they're extremely beautiful, these drawings, they weren't made for artistic purposes. They were part of the Enlightenment project, the encyclopedic cataloguing of biodiversity to bring natural creation into a single um, divinely created scheme, to bring order to the existing chaos of many local knowledges and nomenclatures. And behind this, of course, was um, the desire for improvement for the condition of man, which was also div divinely ordained in the Judeo-Christian tradition, that um, creation was there for man's use and exploitation. Um, so, because plants, of course, were the foundation of everything, the whole of life, and including things like medicinal uses of plants, food plants, um, the surgeons had a major part in botanical study, and until the late 19th century, you could only really study botany at university as part of the medical syllabus. And so lots of these surgeons came out to work in India and found this amazing wealth in India. Britain's got 1,500 species of flowering plants, India's got 17,000. So of course they were intrigued, um, and the works of Linnaeus was there as a framework to fit this the, these new discoveries um, and Edinburgh was one of the great centers for medical education in the 18th century so that's how we ha happen to have some of these collections um, I've um, so th actually I'll start with this picture um, Sita also pointed out that um, it was the North Indian schools that have been best known, mainly because they're so incredibly beautiful, and those are the ones by painters who probably did have origins in um, court mogul traditions. This is an example um, by an artist called Bhavani Das. But we don't have many of those drawings in um, Edinburgh. I've now monographed three of our collections um, and the aim has been not only to try to find more about the artists but where and why the paintings were made, how they relate to the dried specimens in our herbarium and I've also used them to plot biographies of the people who commissioned them. Um, so moving on to the first of the collections that I did, commissioned by someone called Robert White, who came to India to the Madras presidency in 1819, between 1825 and 1850. He used two Telugu-speaking artists that he found probably in Tanjavur, um, two artists of the Raju caste, 
um, and there's a big question here. These these Tanjore artists have been known as moochies. I've just been to Tanjore and spoken to Raju painters, and you mentioned the word moochie to them, and they look so you've sworn, because those are low-cost leather workers, and how this um, designation was applied to um, these fine painters is a great mystery that needs to be resolved. I would begin to wonder if it was a sort of joke that the, they played on the British and said, you know, oh, these sort of moochie painters, as a sort of like we use painters in the state, you know, like decorators, that there were actually two distinct types. Moochie's doing probably quite crude painting of things like toys, and then the ones like this who. Um, absolutely incredibly skilled who probably also did the work that Preeta Naya talks about um, working for Sofoji the Tanjore um, Raja so this was um, Rangaya um, White's first artist who worked for him for about 20 years and then either died or got too old and he took on a second artist called Govindu I suspect they were probably related. Certainly, Govindu must have been taught by um, his uh, predecessor. The second collection that I worked on, this is the one that the cover image is taken from, a collection made in the late 1840s, by, uh, commissioned by someone called Alexander Gibson, um, who was the first forest conservator for the Bombay presidency. And he, there wasn't such a strong tradition of painting um, in Western India at this time. In fact, Chinese artists were being used. And by looking into archives at, um, very carefully, I came across this reference in a letter from Gibson to um, William Hooker at Kew to say that he'd borrowed this Portuguese artist from J.S. Uh, Law, the collector of Tane. So here is a, an artist from an utterly different tradition, Indo-Portuguese, presumably he came from Goa, with a very, very different style of painting, much more graphic than the more painterly ones of the South. Um, the third one I have um, worked on, a major collection um, for someone called Hugh Cleghorn, who also went to Madras in um, the 1840s, and he employed a whole, he had about 3,000 drawings made over the next um, 15 years. This is the first artist he used in Karnataka, um, in a place called Shimoga, which was a great sandalwood carving area. And because of the very, very strong graphic um, elements of the, this style, I speculate that this guy was actually um, a sandalwood carver. Unfortunately, Cleghorn never recorded his name. Um, Cleghorn also used White's art, second artist, Govindu. Um, but then in 1850, a complete radical development happened in Madras. Also started by a, a Scottish company surgeon called Alexander Hunter. He started an art school, completely philanthropic in, art, in aims. He paid for it out of his own pocket. And it was to teach Indian and Anglo-Indian boys skills that would enable them to get better paid jobs with the British. So he was teaching things like pottery, engraving. As early as 1855, he was teaching photography, amazingly and also teaching um, botanical illustration. And he didn't want, um, by this time, South Kensington had started sending out teaching packages with, you know, you could teach an Indian child to paint a British daisy. Well, why do that when there are wonderful plants growing right outside? So he was quite radical in his way, but it is an utterly new phase in Indian art this um, training people by a taught method rather than traditional caste-based apprenticeships. Um, so this selection has shown the wide range of um, traditions that were available to these surgeons if they wanted drawings made of birds or plants or archaeology, whatever. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I want the abandonment of this company school 
terminology, not just because it's slightly, I mean, it takes the balance away from the artist to the commissioner, but it, it, it makes it seem as though it was a school and it wasn't a school. It was a whole range of amazing coincidences. But how can we get further? I'm afraid I can't speak any Indian languages. It needs people with linguistic skills, but also art historical approaches. Um, you know, these artists were show, taught how to draw in a sort of Western style by being shown models, but their traditions were not doing naturalistic painting. They must have been doing frescoes in temples. This is a picture I took at Tanjore the other day. So, you know, could this same painter have then gone on to doing work for the British? And looking for other kinds of work that might have been done, they wouldn't have been working for the British all the time. They must have been doing other things. But the only example I've ever found of a work in a different style by a botanical artist is this rather mogul style um, portrait made in 1828 by a Calcutta botanic gardener, it's called Lakshman Singh, showing the head gardener smoking his hooker. Um, in the article I wanted to, oh yes, I'm sorry, the last thing to um, find kind of transitional works from um, earlier, more, more traditional forms of painting that they might have been doing before the British came along. And this is one example which Preto Nair also talks about, um, in, made in Tanjore in about 1790. And you see the little landscape, that's something that would not have been done on a, um, one of the later ones. Um, in my article, I wanted to leave the last word as a deliberately provocative statement, um, but I was asked to remove it, but I rather regret having agreed to that, so I'm going to say it now as a stimulus for, um, for future discussion. Mildred Archer was really responsible for um, developing this whole idea of a company school, but she did say she was prepared to admit that it was actually a, part, a major part of Indian art, not just a foreign import. We've just seen examples from the Mughal period of you know, fusion between European herbals. Um, foreign influences have always been a part of Indian art. It wasn't some sort of aberration. So what she said was that the company school was the last original contribution by Indian artists before the modern deluge. So that's something you can go and think about. Um, but that is the aim of a, an exhibition that I'm slightly involved with happening in the Wallace Collection in London in September. Um, mainly curated by William Dalrymple, but it's going to be called Forgotten Masterpieces of Indian Art to get the balance back to the Indian artists of the late Mughal style or whatever you want to call it. Sorry, I've gone on too. I'm, I'm Lena Vincent, and to wind up this absolutely beautiful series of presentations on uh, the volume, I'd like to share this small experience of having interacted with and having been in the Blatter Herbarium. I am trained as a printmaker and art historian and my work has taken me into a space which overlaps education, uh, uh, art and design as well as science in some ways. And to have this particular opportunity to contribute to a volume of, uh, of this standard was something that first shook me, but after that excited me. So thank you, Sita. Thank you, Rizio, and everyone. Here at uh, the Blatter Herbarium, many of those who are at St. Xavier's College itself do not know that it exists. It is tucked away, really, in a tiny corner of this beautiful uh, architecture. and. Uh, a very simple person presides over the opening, the, the locking and the unlocking of the cupboards that host these many treasures. So, as I said, because of coming from a printmaking background, I, we discussed originally to look at printmaking as a means of reprodu reproducing botanical drawings. Printmaking as a medium 
really transformed the way an image could be multiplied, shared, published, sent across the world, which original paintings could not do in the same way. So, in this beautiful place, I got to see for the first time the hottest Malabaricus, some images of which I think were in Sita's presentation. And we discussed about how do we look at printmaking itself, as I said, as a means of reproducing these botanical drawings, and also uh, to maybe identify a species or a form that could then become the focus area underlying its introduction into the bladder herbarium. I uh, had the opportunity to talk with uh, Dr. Shinde, who is now actually the principal at uh, Xavier's College. And uh, he was kind enough to uh, also give me further introductions into the establishment of Blatter Herbarium. Uh, Ethelbert Blatter, Father Ethelbert Blatter was actually a Jesuit priest with an enormous interest in botany and he is actually well known for his own contributions to studying palms in the southeast, uh, in the southern, uh, in, in the Indian region. And uh, based on these few bits of information, we came upon the idea to actually uh, explore the notion of palms as depicted in printmaking. So it became a, 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 a focus study within the larger area of studying botanical drawing, studying the importance of archives themselves and what they preserve, and also the idea that these elements, this, this interaction with, uh, with the botanical history is, I think, something very crucial to us today. In this, in this uh, age of what we speak of uh, ecological grief, of the sort of destruction of a lot of the environment around us, to consider and to uh, highlight and to mark these different elements was something that was important. So uh, I uh, was able to actually look at three or four really beautiful books and uh, uh, volumes. One, of course, The, the Hottest Malabaricus by uh, Hendrik Van Reed, and the wonderful uh, depiction of engravings, which some of them are named and some of them are not named. But also, uh, uh, Cristobal Acosta's volume, which was after uh, colloquies, but contained a number of beautiful woodcuts. So I actually got the opportunity to interact with the image and the form in different ways to identify how printmaking itself had changed over this entire period from the very basic standardized use of space and the black and white graphic image as you can see in, in this woodcut here and to the really complex identification with volume, with form, with depth and with also this, this larger comfort with the material which was copper plates that came later. So, uh, looking, looking at all these aspects, it was also to me an introduction to a lot of the botanical history that came along with that, which I didn't know. So, uh, with this, Tenga, which is the, uh, in fact the first series of fo uh, folios that uh, open up the, the volume one of Hortus Malabaricus. <coughs> to in fact a later period of work by Robert White when he decided that it was too expensive to have his works uh, illustrated and published 
he decided that he would learn lithography, which is another medium of printmaking. So you have woodcut, you have etching, you have also lithography, which uh, really uh, uh, was, uh, 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 it opened up the area of printmaking to a large extent because of the technology itself. And uh, though he could not himself run the lithographic press, he employed a lithographic press to then convert the drawings of the same Rangaya and Govindu into line drawings, lithograph, uh, lithograph plates, which were then later hand colored to a certain extent in some cases. So with that was my, uh, uh, you know, my trips to the Blatter Herbarium were filled with these joys of looking at these pages within these volumes, considering that they are paper, many of them are disintegrating, many of them are struggling to keep their structure. But in the end, I think a volume like this brings together the entire area. So I'm glad to be here today, and I think that we are almost at the end of our time. But I will uh, end with these final images where you can see the extent of detail that went into developing these drawings, these really fine engravings that are part of the hottest Malabar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sita. Henry and uh, Lena. Uh, um, uh, I think we are really running short of time, so I'll just wind up. We were, uh, I mean, if we had time, we would have loved to talk about it. I mean, it would have been interesting to listen to them talking, but I think uh, what we can do is we can open this up. But before just closing, I would like to mention to you, you it, it is very evident that it's a very interdisciplinary uh, approach that uh, Mark has adopted in this particular volume and I really thank Sita for uh, doing this absolutely remarkable work. Um, uh, one, a few things which I just want to flag uh, in this volume, you can all get a copy of this, you know, it's a treasure, so you must get it. Um, but uh, three or four things which are very, very relevant today one, as Sita said, uh, there is this whole thing of educating children. We, we were at lunch, we were just talking about uh, Hyderabad and how urban development is affecting the natural. Uh, Pranay was talking about how the natural, the, you know, uh, the, the, the scene is changing completely because you have a certain idea of development, etc. So it's very important to touch the children and put them in touch with nature put them in touch with the blessings of nature. So what Nera and you know, the, the whole, that school, uh, this, their schools are doing is absolutely vital. And uh, this has to be encouraged. The second thing is like this whole uh, knowledge that uh, Henry is bringing into this about like how it is even today very relevant. How this whole, many sections of our society that really work on things and it's in, in the art field also this is very important even today you see big installations put up in different places but artisans are doing those they are not even acknowledged uh, they just do the work our own artists are doing it even today so it's so very relevant this insertion of names Second thing, uh, the third thing is about the larger ecological vision that we should all develop rather than the very anthropocentric kind of thing. It perhaps like this whole idea of the Renaissance ma man, the, uh, it, it's, it's really backfiring now. So we'll, it's very important to look at nature and see human beings as part of nature and not as, you know, outside of it and ruling governing uh, nature from their perspective. So this volume is not just a, a, like a, an archive of botanical arts, but it's very, very relevant for our times. So with that, I would like to open this for discussion, maybe two or three questions, and you can meet them here. They are here, so you can have further discussion. Anyone with 
Any question? We'll just have two questions, please. Uh, you can also uh, look at this, this where Lena and Vincent's exhibition, Gaitasan, at Gaitasan room are here. Please have a look at it also. Can I ask a question? Uh, some of the uh, photographs that you put up seemed as if they were from windows or doors. Is that right? Uh, the framing su looked such, I mean, it didn't look like a frame, photo frame or a painting frame, but it seemed as if it had been shot from a window or a door in Tanjore or some other place, yeah. especially the Tanjore uh, photographs. Oh, the, the um, one of, from Tanjore, yeah. yeah. Well, that is very interesting. It's not a window, it's actually a piece of paper stuck and then a margin painted round about it which of course is a kind of um, traditional way of mounting albums, you know, the Islamic Maraca albums where they had a border around it. So that's one reason I showed that. It, is a, it's, it shows a much earlier tradition, something that the British never went on with. And out of your entire collection, which is there in your book, what percentage actually came from our museums or our Indian government archives? there were 23 contributors, including the artists. So from, say, the archival section, about half, about half. And actually, that's a good po point you raise, because part of the nature of these botanical art archives is that they've been dispersed. There are duplicates in Calcutta. But they, there are also duplicates at, say, Kew Gardens or Edinburgh, where Henry was working. And so you can, you can actually see the comparison of how they've disintegrated here versus a pristine, the pristine condition they're in there. And part of well, scholars like Henry is they've had to put together the art, from the, which is in one part of, say, the botanic garden, with the herbaria and dried specimens. I don't know if that came through. Painstaking work with the manuscript collection of the botanists, which is elsewhere. You know, so. Anyone else, or can I ask another question? Are there any attempts being made uh, to uh, create digital archives and uh, of these uh, um, these uh, you know prints? In the, in the Indian um, archives not that much. In, I'm going to hand it over to Henry to speak about what's happening in the UK. Um, the Q digitization project is quite extensive, but Edinburgh as well. well now, obviously the ideal these days is for as much to be made uh, digitally available, but the trouble is institutions like my own, they've got these huge collections um, you know, three and a half million herbarium specimens. I don't even know how many Indian botanic drawings we've got, but at least 10,000. Um, and the sheer effort of digitizing them, you know, it is going painfully slowly. But one thing that's happening here, I should just mention, on the 14th of February, um, the whole Clegg Corn collection has been digitized, um, and those. Um, a selection of those were prints were made in Chennai. They've been on show there, and they're about to come to the Goethe Institute here. So, you know, that is a way of make, bringing this stuff back. And, yeah, the Goethe Institute, and then the State Museum in March. <laughs>